So I preached a couple of Sundays ago at another church in Peoria, and they gave me the task of preaching from Matthew 9, um, the verse that talks about the laborers, the, the harvest is, is great, but the laborers are few. And, and I preached that message, and you know, the Lord just really sent me back there to give you another word from that today. And so that's where I'm going to preach from. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right in. Amen. Father, we give you praise and honor, and I thank you today for your word. I thank you for your presence. Lord, I ask right now that you would open up our ears to help us to hear what it is that you're speaking to us so that we will know with clarity uh, your call for us. What is it you're in, inviting us to? What does it even mean to be uh, when you talk about the invitation? So Father, I pray right now that our ears hear, our hearts receive, and that we move upon what you show us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I'm reading from Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. And um, one of the things that I'm going to do, I'm going to read the scripture, and I'm going to go back and give you a little bit of the recap. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation, starting at verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and the disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw that they, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And we Amen. thank God for his word. And so, you know, many of you already know I'm kind of a storyteller. And when I see things, I really see kind of from this perspective of looking at the pieces. And so before I start to tell you the pieces, I want to kind of give you an overview of some of the bigger pieces of this whole chapter now. We see, and you can go back and read it, but in verse 3, there's this encounter that Jesus has with the religious leaders. When he's doing something, they ask this question, who does he think he is, God? Because they're questioning him. And, and what that first show us is that God was really, I believe the, the word is setting us up to even before we get to the scripture so we understand what Jesus is dealing with. In this perspective, he's dealing with an unbelieving and hard heart. Right. And the only thing that's going to ever fix a hard heart, an unbelieving heart, is a new heart. Amen. And then as we go down, we'll see in verse 11, that, which is what we just did. They said, why are you eating with scums? Well, this right here we see is this elitist heart that has this picking and choosing who do they think can be with God and who they think can, is the right kind of person. It's this picking and choosing to see and say, I think you're right or I don't think you're right. And there's this elitist heart, but the only cure for an elitist heart is a loving one. Amen. And then we, if we jump down to verse 14, we see this encounter with um, John the Baptist's disciples. And, and they asked the question to Jesus is, why don't they fast like us? They said, why don't they fast like us in the right, Pharisees? Right. Because see, what that is, is that is a comparing heart. We have this, this difficulty sometimes among us as children of God. We compare ourselves to somebody else, both in a good way and a bad way. Sometimes we compare ourselves and, and, and we come up lacking. We look at them and say, oh, they're a great saint or a great this and I'm way down here. Or we compare ourselves up here and we look down on other people. Right. But that's not what God wants because guess what? That makes us not prepared to be those that can go to the harvest. And so instead of us having a comparing heart, God wants us to have a heart of companionship Amen. where I'm working with you and you're working with me. I'm not better than you. You're not worse than me. I'm not better. We're not, we're not in this comparison kind of thing. Amen. And then in verse 34, what happens is he, he heals and the Pharisees again all, of, all the time got something to say bad about Jesus. They say in verse 34, he healed him by a demonic spirit. Right. See, this is a condemning heart. It's one thing to have a hard heart. 
Well, you say, oh, you can't be this and that. But it's another thing to say, you're not this and that. And because I have judged you as not uh, measuring up, now I condemn you and say that what you're doing cannot be from God. Right, right. And so God says, I can't even use that kind of heart in this field to be the ones that invite people to come and learn about me. Amen. He said, what I need to do is bring in you a believing heart. Right. A believing heart. And I'm setting us up because we, I believe the scripture shows us the comparison. And remember, these are all religious kind of people. Amen. None of the hearts he's showing us above the heart of the sinner. Because even Jesus said in the word, he said, For I have come to call those, not those who think, think, think they are righteous. Right. But those who know they are sinners. And see, they thought they were righteous. The Pharisees, the scribes, the religious people, they thought they had it together. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have a heart the way God wants, we can't be used in the harvest. Amen. And so we jump back to the scripture that I am in. And I wanted to start with verse 9. And I call this the encounter. What happens in verse 9? Well, we see in verse 9 that Jesus was walking along and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collect collector's booth. And I thought about the song we just sang and it says, he knows your name. He knows all about you. He stopped and he had this conversation with Matthew. He didn't say, I see you at the tax collector's booth and therefore I know that you're this horrible person because you have to understand that it was the difference of calling Matthew and the other fishermen was different because a fisherman, that was an honorable job. A tax collector, not so much. Amen. They were in fact considered to be uh, equivalent to robbers and murderers. And yet he says to this tax collector, follow me and be my disciple. Right, right. And I, I appreciate this because the first thing we can understand is this. God didn't choose any one of us because of how great we were. Amen. In fact, many of us, if we looked at our history, we'd be like, well, please don't let none of my bones fall <laughs> out because I don't want nobody to know how horrible I was. And so we are reminded to stay in a place of humility to understand Amen. that I am not who I am because of myself. It is because of what God did to me. Because he saw this sinner sitting in a place of her sin doing what she was sinful in, right, and he right. calls me to come. So he calls Matthew sitting in his tax collector booth, sitting in what was considered a, a not an honorable place. Right. Luke 19.10 uh, 19, says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. He didn't need you. You didn't need a save if you, was, if you already had it all together. But to promise you something, none of us had it all together. So we Amen. all were in need of a Savior. Amen. And so the question then we ask is, who does Jesus call to be his disciples? He calls those that are willing to come. Because right. it says he got up and followed him. I don't see him going into a dialogue, a dialect. Well, okay, where am I? Follow you where? Where are you going? Who are you? Why should I follow you? Right, give me right. some, give me your resume. Give me your, give me something to let me know why I should follow you. Right. And oftentimes that's what keeps us from taking the, the invitation from Jesus and moving forward because we want him to give us a whole dossier of why we should follow him and right. where we going and I need you to right. know when I'm going to get there and how I'm going to get there. He says just come, follow me because that's where faith comes in. Amen. That's where faith comes in. See, if he told us everything, where then would we have faith? And then what does it really mean to be his disciples? Well, Matthew 28, 19 says, says Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. First of all, that means how I become a disciple is I have to first accept the call. And then I got to go out and try to call others. Amen. But what I appreciate this is what we have to understand. Matthew's calling didn't mean instant perfection. Right, right. He wasn't instantly completely changed of everything. He was made new because when we accept God through Christ Jesus, we are made new. But now we got to change old habits. All ways of thinking, all ways of doing, all ways of being, right. all ways, all ways. All that has to be made new. And it's called process. Amen. Some of us don't like process. I know I don't like process because process sometimes hurts. Because guess what? You got to die. You got to get up and die daily to you be, so you can become the new you. Amen. 
And in Matthew 10 and 1 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. To be a disciple, see many of us okay with being a Christian, meaning I've accepted Christ, so I just go to church and tick off, tick off the days that I've did something. But disciples mean I must be like Christ. What does it mean to be like Christ? He was concerned. He had compassion. He went and saw the needs of people and he answered by way of God. And that's how we have to do. We have to go and see how we can become healing in the place. Right. How we can bring life to people. Amen. What is it that we need to do so that we can be who God has called us to be? Jesus. So that's our encounter. What, is, what have we done with the account, encounter that we've had with Christ? Are we still at the encounter phase? Are we still at the place where we just say, okay, I've heard about Jesus, but are you still giving them excuses and reasons why you can't totally submit? But then he goes on in verse 10. And here we have what I call the invitation. Jesus, Matthew goes and follows Jesus, but it says later, what did Matthew do? He invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. He said, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Well, my goodness. Isn't that something that we often don't want to do? Amen. We want to invite the people that we like. We want to invite the people that look like us. We want those to come to us that we are comfortable with. Well, guess what? We can't always just associate with those that make us comfortable. Amen. And so in, in, if you see that scripture, Romans 10 now says this, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. And really that is the point that, of, of the invitation. Right. Because what I, I, I appreciate about this is, is, is this one thing. When you have a dinner, it speaks to intimacy. It speaks to fellowship. How many of us, and I know we was telling the truth, if you made this really formal, beautiful dinner, you're not getting ready to go invite the people off the street to your house. First of all, you're like, I don't want to invite these people to my house. I don't know who they are. You're not necessarily going to invite somebody you angry with, mad with. You're not going to do that. Why? You're going to invite those that you feel comfortable with. But what I appreciate Matthew was doing, he's made a change and he's going back and inviting those who used to be like him. So even though he wants to change, he realized they need to change too. Amen. And sometimes we can get in this habit, oh, I'm a Christian now, so I have to cut off all the sinners. Yeah, you cut off the sinful behavior, but don't cut off sinning them and bringing them and inviting them to sit down with Jesus. Amen. Revelations 3 and 20, 20 says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. I think this is important. This is what I, I believe the scripture is trying to show us. That God is saying, I want to be your friend. I, not only do I want to be your Lord and Savior, but I want us to have a conversation. I want to be your friend. Remember what the song said, I am his friend. Amen. What a blessing to be able to be called a friend of God. Right, right. We were his enemies on the other side of friendship. Amen. In our sins, we were, we were enemies to God. How were you an enemy to God? Because you were contrary to everything that was in his law, everything that was in his word. You were his enemy because you were living in the enemy's camp, whether you thought you were or not. But think about it this. How many people step into the enemy camp, snatch you out, and then say you could be in my camp? How many people that you know has been your enemies, all of a sudden now you're going to make them your best friend? Uh-uh. You're going to be watching them with both eyes. Like, what is they doing? Where are they going? Why are you over there? Why are you talking to them? What you doing? Why, why, why? Because we don't trust you. But the thing God trusts us enough to call us his friend. Amen. And it also speaks of something new. See, Jesus, remember all of the, this background I gave you about the hard heart. And the scripture really still has to do with there being a lot to harvest, but not a, la a lot of laborers to go. The problem is many of us aren't ready to go because we're not ready to sit down and to have compassion on those that don't look like us. Amen. 
We're not ready to say, let me invite you as a dinner guest. Come and sit with Jesus. Come and sit with his disciples. It doesn't matter what you look like. I don't care if you're a disreputable sinner. You invited in. Come in. Have a seat. And I'm going to treat you like an honored guest. And not just to my church, but into my life. I'm going to take the time, and I'm not going to just walk past you. I'm going to take the time and say, God, how can I be a help to this person? I don't know what they're going through, and I don't know why they're going through. I'm not going to judge them, but what I'm going to do is listen to what you say so that I can be a help in that time. Amen. Because I want to be able to give them an invitation to come and sit with you. Because I know just like we might not invite people we didn't like, people that don't like us not going to come and be invited. Amen. If you treat me nasty, I'm not going. There ain't nothing you invite me to. I'm going to say thank you and keep going. So if, you're, if your approach to me as a sinner is, you on your way to hell and ain't nothing good in you. Well, I might have knew that already. Well, why don't you give me the good news? That ain't the good news. The good news, I ain't got to go to hell. The good news is that Jesus saved. The good news is there is a different way that I've been doing it all my life. That's the good news. Tell me the good news and I may show up. Thank you, Jesus. And then we have verse 11. I call it the complaint. The Pharisees sees this and they are outraged. They indignant. And what do they say? They say they ask, why, is, why does your teacher eat with such scum? You know, I mean, that's a lot of nerve. That's a lot of nerve. But guess what? It's a, when you're prideful and haughty, you do have a lot of nerve to say some stuff you ought not be saying. Amen. Doing some things you ought not be doing. Because we get into this place that we see others from our standard and not from God's. Christ died for what you who you call in scum. He That's died right. for that person. That's right. You and I didn't do nothing for him. Well, they didn't nail no cross in my hand for him, for them. It not nailed you. We didn't get nailed to a cross for the sins of nobody else. Amen. But he took them. And if he felt they were worthy of his dying, how am I have to have a right to be able to make a judgment? I do not. Right, right. And so the Pharisees, they called them, you know, how are you having uh, dinner with such scum? Would well, they would not see them as, as worthless. But Christ is saying, no, 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 I need you to see everybody as somebody I invite to come and taste and see that I am good. Amen. I want you to invite somebody to know that I love them, that I right, that, right, that right. I died for them, that I have something for them. There is a better way. They don't have to keep doing it the way they do it. And that lie that we believe, I'm going to get it together first and come to God, that's what it is a lie. Because if you could get it together first and then come to Him, why would you need Him? Amen. But we all need Him. So you can't get it together. Right, you right, can't right. fix it. You can't correct the the things in your life. The stuff that you know you're not supposed to be doing and you still doing, you can't even stop doing it in yourself. You need the blood. You need a savior. You need his power so that you can break off those things off your life. Amen. But I love in verse 12 is Jesus' response. Jesus basically tells them healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And really what he was telling them was Romans 3.23, for everybody is sinned and has fallen short of, of God's glorious standard. Amen. And un unfortunately, sometimes people in their own arrogance don't see it. See, they probably didn't understand what Jesus was telling them, this Pharisee. They didn't understand that Jesus was saying, you are in need of help. Right. Because unfortunately, if we are puffed up and think we've got it all together, we don't see that we are in need. Amen. And my heart cry is, Lord, don't ever let me get so puffed up that I think I've arrived somewhere. Because I, as long as you're on this earth, you can always be on a journey. Amen. He grows you in one area. Guess what? There's another place for you to grow. And then when he grows you in there, there's another place for you to grow. In fact, the more that I grow, I feel like the more humble it is making me. Because I realize that where I might have thought sometimes I had it together, then guess what? Some in life will come up and show, uh-uh, Julie, you ain't got it all together. You got, you quickly got an attitude. Your neck got to rolling. Uh-uh, you didn't have it together. So, Lord, thank you. You showing me that I, too, can be affected by life. I, too, can be affected by things. And so, guess what? You stay at a place of humility because then you could be one of the workers. 
Amen. Then he can use you in the field to go and snatch somebody else out of the hand of the enemy. That's what God wants us to understand. That it is not about us thinking that we got it all together because we don't. And then he told him what in verse 13? He told him, I need you to go learn something. Now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have not come to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And he's using that scripture, Hosea 6 and 6. And it says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifice. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offering. And that's so significant. Because we might say, we're not burning no offerings today. But guess what? We get into doing. We get into thinking if I do enough stuff for God, then that gives me like that checks off. We and I'm gonna admit I'm, I'm a this kind of person, so I'm always checking stuff off. But guess what I can tell you is it don't matter how much you check stuff off on the list. God is not saying that that don't make you no more holy because you can check off you some d right, things right. to do. He said, I don't want you to just get into doing for me. He said, what I want you to get into is knowing me. Amen. Know who I am. Know my heart. Give yourself to me so that you can receive all that I have for you. Amen. And because when we do what? When we, we, when we get to the place where we stop just trying to do to receive, but that we know him and allow him to work on the inside of us, we're ready for the harvest. Amen. We're ready to go out and help somebody. We're ready to go and do what he's called us to do. I don't know about you, but I know for me, that is my desire. I want to be used by him to do the things and the work that he wants us to do. Amen. John 3, 16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. But see, that's, the, that's, that's what you and I receive. He loved us so much, but he died for us. But now guess what? He requires something for us because if you go to the next slide, he said, this is what I want you to learn. First John 3, 6 says, you know what real love is because Jesus gave us his life, for, his, of his life for us. So we also to give our lives up for our brothers and our sisters. Amen. And guess what that means? That don't mean that I'm just, you just my brother and my sister because we are the same church together. I believe God says you are by, by, by race, by just by creation. Look at everybody as your brother or your sister. By creation, what are you doing? By creation, are you trying to help those that are lost? And I thank God that we have, if we have a sensitivity to that, we can hear. Remember not that long, a couple of weeks ago, we were going to the lunch with Sister Tiffany because it was her birthday. We stopped at the post office. And I have a habit, what I do, wherever I go, I always ask God, show me my assignment. Who is the person I'm supposed to bless? There's an assignment today. I don't believe we wake up any day and God don't have somebody assigned to hear a word from you, a blessing from you, for you to encourage. Because guess what? When you get out of you and start blessing somebody else, then you're able to receive more things from God because your focus is no longer just on you, but how I can be a vessel to be used. And so when we went into the store, and to the post office, rather, there was a lady, an older lady, and I could sense that she was just in a place of despair. And so I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, you go and just pray with her. Now, you know, I could have said, we in the post office. This might not be the right place to pray. And, you know, sometimes we let those things scare us and not make us move. But when you have a heart the way God wants you to have a heart, you will move with compassion. You don't care what you look like. You'll look foolish to people to do what God wants you to do. Amen. So when I, I went to the lady, as I was walking towards her, I heard her say, Lord, this is hard. And I said, ma'am, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just feel like the Lord sent me here to pray with you because you're going through a heart attack. She just started to cry. And she had one of those walkers that she could sit on, and I told her, go ahead and sit down. And I prayed for her. But that wasn't it. I said, Lord, what else? Tell me. What else am I supposed to do? How else do I show up and give the invitation that you are calling for her in this time? And so he said, reach in your pocket and pull out your money and give the money to her. She didn't ask me for no money. But I reached in, I took the $40 I had in my purse, and I said, here, this is for you. And I hugged her. And she hugged me so tight. And I said, here's my number if you need to pray. And she did. She called me not that long ago, and I prayed with her. And why did I tell you this? That woman may never walk in this church door. 
but I had an opportunity to sit with her through the spirit and feast with her by phone to just encourage her and tell her God loves you. He loves you enough to stop people in their everyday activities to stop by you and say you are loved. Amen. How many of us have gone through some times in our lives and we just needed somebody to come by and say, God cares for you. Amen. God loves you. I know you messing stuff up, but God says I still love you and I'm not giving up on you. Sometimes you just need somebody to say a, a word for you. I don't need you to come condemn me because most of the time I'm already condemning myself. I just need somebody to say Jesus loves you and he'll give you the power. He'll give you the strength. He will be with you no matter what you go through so that you can make it. And, and not only that, but God wants us to be the kind of people. Thank you that shows up and shows compassion. We got to show compassion because it's so easy it's the, as we saw with these, these religious people to be self-righteous. I have no righteousness in myself. All righteousness has been given to me by God. Not so that I can lord it over you, but so that I can come and remind you that there's a Savior that loves you. Amen. There's a Savior that wants to heal you. Amen. There's a Savior that wants to change your life. That's so right. that I can be like the invitation that shows up and when you open it, you see Jesus. That's what he wants from us. In this time where things are going crazy, people need to see Jesus. Amen. They need to know he will break whatever bond that you in. Yes, you got to trust him. Right. You got to do like Matthew did in verse right. 9. Right. Right. When he said he walked along, he saw him and he called him. You got to stop debating with him. You got to stop saying, well, I come after I fix this. I come after I fix that. I come when this change. He said, I didn't ask you all of that. I knew you before you was even why you was born in your mama's womb. If I knew you then, don't you know I know everything you've ever done? Right. I know your Amen. future. I know your past. I know your present. But if you'll help let me, I will take you to the future that I have for you. Amen. So we have to, so there's a responsibility each one of us has, is we must be willing to follow him. And I appreciate Matthew, he said, it, quickly he got about inviting. Quickly. quickly he got about saying, let me be about my father's business. Amen. Not when I got all my deliverance, <laughs> not when all of my life is perfect, then I'm going to go invite somebody or I'm going to invite somebody to Jesus. And I'm not just talking about inviting somebody to church. I'm talking about inviting somebody to the Savior. Right. Yes, church is necessary. Scripture said don't forbid to assemble yourselves together. I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about relationship. Right. Amen. That's what even as a pastor, I don't want you to just come to the church and sit here and look at me. I don't, Pastor James, I want you to just come here and listen to us. We want to help you grow to become the disciples that Christ called you to be. And a disciple looks like the one he or she follows. We are following after Christ, so we should look like Christ. We should sound like Christ. We should love like Christ. We should have compassion like Christ. We should have patience like Christ. Even when the people that get on your nerve and you really want to slap them, but you hold your hand and put it on your own head and say, Lord, help me so I don't slap nobody. You move Jesus. in the right direction instead of moving in the wrong direction. Amen. You say, I'm going to stop being hard-headed and I'm going to stop being prideful thinking I know it all because your wisdom don't mean a hill of beans. But godly wisdom is what all of us need. Amen. And that is what a disciple does. Humbles him or herself and says, Lord, I'm going to follow your, after your you. Way. Amen. Because you said you didn't come to call those who think they are righteous. And I appreciate that. He didn't say those that are righteous. He said those who think they are righteous. Yep. That's the key word. Think. So in other words, he came to call all of us. Amen. But those who think they're righteous, you are the hardest. Those are the hardest ones to get to because they think they got it all. I know enough. I can do enough. I got it together. No, you don't. None of us have it together in ourselves. Amen. So what's the invitation? The invitation is to be a disciple of Christ. But in the process, what he wants to do is he wants to, he wants you to allow him to heal you so you can invite others to the table. He wants to heal you of whatever is going on in your life, 
Whatever disappointments, whatever frustrations, whatever keeps you in bondage, he wants to heal that. And I'm going to promise you and I'm going to tell you this because I know, I know, I know. Sometimes the getting from point A to point B seems like it should just go, I'm here and I should go here. And why does it feel like God take you around this way, here, over here, <laughs> over here, here, here. And then you be like, Lord, I ain't got it yet. Because point A, you thought point B was here. He said, no, point B was never there. That's what you thought. And it might seem like it's this, this is it. He said, because I am actually keeping you from the things that would hinder and hurt you. Amen. You just got to trust my process. You got to trust that I have the best intention for you. So though it seems like something may be hard, know that I am working it out for your good. I'm using it to grow you up. Amen. And when I grow you, and as I grow you, you go back and grab somebody else. Right. You go back and tell somebody else that, that I can help them. I can heal them. I am the one that they come to. No, stop trusting in yourself because you don't know what you're doing anyway. Amen. And in fact, what you've been doing all of the time, it ain't working. How is that working for you? Because you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. That's called insanity. So stop doing the same thing, expecting something different to happen when it's not. What's going to change is when you change and when you release your life. And God says, when you accept my invitation. When you accept my invitation. And so I come to you this morning, and I give you an invitation. Amen. The invitation I give to you first is to, 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 are you ready to say, Lord, I want you in my life. I'm going to follow you. He's simply saying, I'm calling you. Come forth. He ain't saying, don't ask him, you know, okay, well, I follow you, but I want to still do this. I want to still do that. I want to do it this way. I want to do that. He no, he's just simply saying, follow me. Trust me for the plans that I have for your life. And if you trust me for the plans that I have for your life, then I will get you to the place that is best, far greater than what you ever could have thought anyway. Amen. Won't you stand with me this morning? Yeah. And I want to pray with you. Whether that prayer is for God to forgive you and bring you to a right place with him or whether that prayer is you're on the path you said I'm following you but the struggle sometimes gets hard because you don't always know how it's going to work out you hope it's going to work out but it's not working out the way you think or you just have a need for God to give you some strength whatever it is I want to pray with you today so I invite you to come to the altar and I tell people all the time, this is something that's important. Yeah, God could bless you in your seat. But if you want what he's offering, you just got to at least take the first step and say, I'm willing to come. I'm willing to, to, to get up. That's the follow. I'm willing to get up and come for what you are asking. And as we do here, I, I have the general prayer. And then if somebody wants special prayer. I will pray for you. But I just want to encourage you that are here this morning. When the Lord is on your side, when you're trusting Him, there's nothing that can defeat you. It might hurt. It might be difficult. It definitely ain't always easy. But if you trust Him and His process, he will bring you to victory. And I'm not telling you something I think. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I've lived. He overcomes broken hearts. Depression. Bondage. Disappointment. Abuse. Anything that the enemy has done in your life. God's spirit can help you. I love the visual God gave me one time. He said, Joel, I didn't need two hands nailed to receive the sins done to you. He said, one hand I outstretched to, to receive every sin you did or ever could do. He said, the other one I outstretched to receive everything done to you. Every abuse done to you. Every mistreatment done to you. Even the stuff you did to yourself. But everything that was done against you. 
I received it out of my hand. Why? So that you could be whole in your entire life. You could be whole. That's what he wants to give to you today. And so I just, as I go to pray, you make your mind up. That's what you receive. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus because you are a good father. And because you are a good father, there is no good gift that you will withhold from your children. And so your children come to you today, Father, and they say, here I am. Father, change me from the inside out. Give me a new heart so that I can be one that will go and snatch others out. Every place that needs healing in my life, I pray right now, Father, that you heal it. Father, right now where there is discouragement, I pray that you would lift that burden and that heaviness from the lives of your people. Father, where there is some uh, uh, depression, I pray right now that you lift it. Yes. The burdens, Father, I pray that you would place it and that you would take it from them, Father. And in place of it, give them strength. Amen. In place of it, Father, give them the assurance and the joy that you are with them. Yes, Lord. Today, Father, I thank you for the shift that you're about to do in this place. Yeah. Father, I thank you for the power that you're releasing over your people. So, Father, we say thank you. We give you honor and praise. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would do a good thing, a new work in your people. And, Father, we just ask that not only do you start it, but, Father, continue. Burn off anything that's in the way. Burn off anything that's not like you. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for the shifting in your people's lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Actually, I don't want all of y'all to stand here. I don't want none of y'all to go because the Lord said I got to pray for each one of y'all that came up here.